Jubilee Church. Welcome to Jubilee this morning. Thank you for sharing your Sunday with us today. And also to our newcomers, thank you for choosing Jubilee. And because you've chosen Jubilee this Sunday, we have a special gift for you, which you can collect at the welcome table after the service, which is a book. And we'd love to get to know you all a bit better. So please come and say hi to us. And we'd love to chat to you after the service. As a local church, we do believe in giving. Our giving goes to supporting the work of the church and various ministries across the city. Most folk give via EFT, but there is also a box in the foyer on the desk for any cash offerings. We have our whole church meeting this Wednesday at Jubilee Observatory. So we'll be meeting Dave and Liz Holden later this morning in the meeting. And we will also be, have an opportunity to meet them on Wednesday, which is open to all our life groups and people and guys that are not in life groups as well. So please join us and we'd love to have you there. Our first baby thanks for the year is on the 19th of February. And as we've been encouraged this morning, how God loves our children, we love our kids, and we would love to sort of pray with you so that you can give thanks to God for your little ones. If you'd like to do that, please email Kaylin, and I think the details are on the slide. Our city moms group, our first city moms group for the year is starting this Friday on the 3rd of Feb, and that's open to all moms with young ones up until the age of three. It's not exclusively to Jubilee moms, so please invite any other friends or moms that you feel might be blessed from a time um, starting the 3rd of Feb from 10.30 to 12, and then every alternate Friday onwards. Every second Thursday. Pray for family members. God answers prayer. We will, be, we will be praying for our family members not yet experiencing God's, good, God's goodness and is starting again on the first Sunday of every month from 9.15 to 10 in room 4. And this is the glass room upstairs, so please join us. I feel a bit tongue twisted this morning. I'm not sure why. <laughs> um, over to Lex, we'll be interviewing Jim Partridge. Yeah. Let's welcome Jim uh, Partridge together. You don't know him yet, but you will know him in a minute. Um, we, uh, this, this week particularly, but this month, as, uh, as Natalie has shared and as we've shared in previous weeks, we, we have friends visiting us from the New Frontiers family of churches, which is uh, the movement of which we've been a part since about eight, 1984. Um, and um, Jim is uh, a friend and a pastor of a, of a church in East Sussex and also serves on what we call an apostolic team. And just to give some context before I ask you some questions, but an apostolic, if you think of Paul and Silas and Timothy, they planted churches and then they kind of revisited those churches you know, helping them grow, helping them with health and so on. We don't mean writing the Bible when we talk about apostles we, or, or new doctrine or new revelation. What we're talking about is helping churches thrive and stay healthy. And Jim visits different eldership teams and different churches and helps them grow. So, hello, Jim. Is this mic on? Did that come through? It did. Oh, there you go. Hello. Excellent. Don't ever put me in charge of technical or production. It's just not my thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jim, just tell us a little bit about yourself, family, yeah. church that you lead. Thank you, Lex. Well, firstly, um, morning, guys. Really wonderful to be here. Really is. Thank you for your welcome. Um, I just love the body of Christ. I love the fact that I could get on a plane for 12 hours and just be here and feel so at home and so like a family. It's just the most beautiful thing. Um, as Lex said, I'm based in the UK, just south of London, just 45 minutes outside London. Um, I'm a pastor. I've been married um, to my wife, Dominique, for 25 years. So um, we yeah, celebrated our 25th in September. Um, we have four children, two girls and two boys. My girls are 21 and 18. One is studying at university in a final year of a history and politics degree. Um, the other is currently somewhere on the east coast of Australia, traveling with a friend for three months. I think she's in Byron Bay at the moment. And I've got two younger lads who are 12 and 10, 
who are good fun, but my wife said, yes, you can go to Cape Town, but only for a week. Do not leave me with them any longer than that. So that is my family, yeah. Um, so now, kind of in terms of your own story, you're not actually, a, you weren't initially like a New Frontiers type person. Um, tell us a little bit about your background and what drew you into this kind of, family of this family of churches that are all over the place yeah great so I, I was raised very grateful to be raised in a, in a Christian home my parents and my grandparents very faithful um, Christians I remember from as early as I can remember going to church twice a Sunday every Sunday 12 30 6 30 without fail in, in a in the UK what would be quite a traditional conservative denomination and um, my journey with New Frontiers only really began once Dominique and I got married and um, had our first child, Millie. Um, we um, were part of an independent evangelical church that hit some challenges and difficulties. And um, we knew we were called to be in the local church and it was just a very painful time. And in our town where we lived, there was a New Frontiers church. And we knew of New Frontiers, but we'd never been part of a New Frontiers church. And this particular church we went to because um, it was just an incredible community. It felt like a family. And my wife's um, sister was a single mum, and she had actually got saved in this church. And they had looked after her incredibly as a, as a single mum. And we'd come from a situation that got very political, and we were like, this isn't the church. And then we saw this community that really, really when you, loved. When you say political, you mean it was arguing about arguing national about politics? Or no, political in the sense of there was lots of infighting in the church between different groups. And we're like, this isn't what I see in, in Scripture. And, and it was painful. And then I saw this community, quite a small church if I, uh, at the time, but I just loved one another. Uh, and they'd expressed incredible love for my sister-in-law. And so we began uh, uh, yeah, to start going to that church, the first experience of a New Frontiers church, and then very quickly realized that, wow, this, this local church, having been part of something that was independent and on its own, this is connected to something all around the world. This is extraordinary. And um, I'd always carried a sense of call for the local church, but couldn't quite figure where that was going to work itself out. And suddenly I found myself part of what is genuinely a global family of churches, thinking this is extraordinary. There's unity and diversity and there's togetherness and family and they love the word of God and actually put it into practice. And so that was when our journey with New Frontiers began. So it's about 2002, so 20 odd years ago. So we'll, we'll come back in the last question to a little bit about the detail of how that affects the local church and what it's good to be connected to something that's yeah. global, but what difference does it make in the local? We'll come back to that. Yeah. But you had an experience of the Holy Spirit, which, so it wasn't just a technical, I see this in the Bible, I see these people loving mm. each other. Something happened to yeah. you as well. Tell yeah. us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So again, like I said, raised in a Christian home, so taught that God is three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, taught the story of Pentecost as something that had happened in history, knew that the Holy Spirit was clearly active in repentance and faith and salvation, but never really been taught or had an encounter of the Holy Spirit. And, um, and I was 20, I must have been 20 years old. I was at a leadership conference when Dominique and I were just dating. And I was actually serving... Um, on a kids team and I can remember being in the volunteer canteen like at these conferences where you go and get your lunch before you go back and serve somewhere else and there was an Italian guy there I Italian guy I can't remember his name I can't even remember his name but I started a conversation with me with, it, with him and he said can I pray with you and I said yeah please pray yeah absolutely and this um, guy started prophesying over my wife and I, um, she wasn't my wife then, we are just dating. Yeah, what does it mean prophesying over me and my wife? Started speaking words, saying, I feel God is saying to you, I feel God wants to encourage you. And this was quite a new experience for me. But started speaking about, you will marry one another, you'll end up in church leadership, 
um, spoke to my wife, said you will release him to travel, which has happened over 25 years. And not we weren't you, engaged. Not you will have four children. No, no, yeah, no. no. Well, there's another story I could tell you with prophecy and our kids. But, and, and then started praying that I would know the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, I've been a Christian for a number of years. I've served as a volunteer in a church for a year. And the only way I can describe it is it felt like electricity rushing through my body. I can remember it as clear as anything, 27 years ago. And it was only then that I then read back into Scripture, like Acts 4, they're in a prayer meeting, and the whole room was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm like, this is a, something I can know. It's not just something that happened. It's something that happens. And I was baptized in the Holy Spirit there in the canteen by an Italian guy that I don't even remember his name. He prayed for me. And actually, everything that he spoke over our lives has come to bear fruit in our lives. So, yeah, that would be our first experience Good to know the, the good things still come from Rome. Yes. <laughs> True. <laughs> <laughs> Just thought I'd throw that one in. Um, okay. That, all of that is dynamic and wonderful. And also, there's been a kind of consistency through life which so it wasn't just like a blip in your story if an apostolic team as I suggested earlier is like Paul and Silas and Timothy going around and visiting the churches that have been planted and you know ensuring health and happiness and joy in God and all the rest of it um, what does that look like now in the kind of new ground new frontiers world and, you know, how does that affect the local church? Right. So, um, like I said, my own story has been part of a church. It was an independent evangelical church. And um, when things got tricky in that church, there was nowhere for us to go. We were utterly isolated. And we didn't know where we could get help. And I was a young leader. I was 22. And thinking, this is crazy. We're hitting some problems here, but there's n th we're not part of anything. How? Where do we go for help in a moment like this? And there wasn't anywhere we could go. And so my wife and I made a promise to one another. We're never going to be part of a church that isn't part of something bigger. And I, never, I didn't even know what that really meant at that time. And then joined New Frontiers and discovered this family of churches, and that's the best way to describe it, of relationship with other churches and with teams that wasn't hierarchical and wasn't about power, but was about care and mission and family and togetherness. And suddenly saw something that, I, again, like you then read back in Scripture and think, oh, I'm experiencing something that I now see back in here. So Paul writes to the Thessalonians and he says to them, when I was with you, I did not only share the gospel with you, but we shared our whole lives with you. So Paul, as a, as a father and apostle to this church, it wasn't, I came and had a functional meeting with you. He says, when I was with you, I shared my life with you as a father and as a mother with the church. And, and you suddenly start reading through the New Testament letters and you read that Paul's relationship with churches was one of deep affection. I long for you with all my heart. I constantly pray for you. I, I long to be with you. I shared my life with you. Deep concern for the churches. But then he describes himself as a father, as a builder, as a layer of foundations. And suddenly you realize when I stepped into the New Frontiers world, that's what it looks like to be part of a local church that has a team that serves you apostolically. In that way, I'm a father, a mother, I care for you, I've shared my life with you. This isn't business, this is family. And, and not only did you then feel that sense of there's accountability and there's security, but you were also suddenly caught up with something much bigger than just your local church because you realize this family is connected to other churches and, and not just in one nation, but multiple nations. And suddenly your horizons are broadened because you're thinking, oh my goodness, this is much bigger than just a local church. And then again, you read the page of the New Testament, you think, that's what I see actually, that's what I read. And so even this morning while I'm here, I'm having text messages with my friends Edward in, Nairobi, in Kenya, who I've got a long friendship with through the New Frontiers family. He's like, I'm praying for you in, down in Cape Town, and I'm, like, I'm praying for you up in Meruin, and my church in the UK are somehow connected to this. And suddenly, 
the, you know, where Jesus says, go to all the ends of the world, you realize, well, that's the only way you can do that is through a family of churches that is truly global. So it, you both get the care from a team, but you also get this kind of being propelled into global mission, which is glorious. It's absolutely wonderful. I think it's not, I think that balance of knowing one another, knowing other churches, having that sense of not just um, organization or uh, identification, brand loyalty. It's it's actually about family. Yeah. It's actually about friendship. It's actually about learning and growing together in God. But it's not only that, it's also about expanding the influence of the Christian message in the world. It's actually about expanding the influence of the gospel. And I know in our own experience within New Frontiers, when we were in India and saw a church in Mumbai planted, uh, there were three New Frontiers churches. Now there are over 200 in that. I mean, in what was that, 30 years ago or something? But, you know, in, thir- in a period of yeah. about 30, 35 years, and it's not like we're just adopting churches into the brand name. Mm. It's not that. It's about more people hearing that there is a Savior who loves them yes. and who died for them and that there's hope. Whatever the circumstance, situation, whatever the cultural context or nation, the gospel of Christ can actually change people's lives. And that's that's brilliant. And it's it's so great to hear how that's working out in your life and in your family's life. And I hope, uh, you know, it won't be too many years before you and Dom, your wife, are in Cape Town enjoying the glories of our beaches oh, and our certainly. sunshine. Cape Town in January <laughs> is much more attractive than the UK in January. Yeah, so that, I'm that's very true glad for, to be here. Yeah, <laughs> just as, as a British person, that's true for any month. Let's yeah, that's just, true. Uh, be yeah. realistic. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, thank you thank so you much. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. <laughs> um, Jim has, and I have alluded to... Uh, not only to New Frontiers, but to the new ground kind of family of churches within New Frontiers. And uh, Dave and Liz Holden are here with us for a month. You're going to hear from both of them uh, a few times, which we're thrilled about. Uh, Chris Taylor, who's a Motswanan and who was uh, originally part of Jubilee, he led our youth group for a while, is also here. Uh, and you'll also, uh, I'm sure, catch up with him and hear from him. Some of you have already met with him this this week. Dave, would you be willing to introduce Liz to us as well? Because you're not here on your own. They come as a couple. But let's welcome Dave as he comes to preach to us too. Thank you so much. Well, we- Give them time to just get this. Is this okay? Great, yeah, so. This is my wife. Um, we have been married for 44 years. And we have four wonderful children who've all left home. They're all married. And they have numerous children. How many grandchildren have we got? <laughs> 13 grandchildren. Wow. Um, and uh, it's been such a, a wonderful joy not only to be in a family that's grown, um, but for Liz and I to have had the joy of many, many years of being connected around the globe with many, many wonderful people. But I think Jubilee Community Church probably sits very, very deep and central in our hearts. I I actually came, this is the 40-year celebration of Jubilee Community Church's existence. It's kind of gone through different names, and I actually came um, the first time in 83, 84, when the church has actually only just started. We're talking to Grant and Gail Gunston. I don't know if any of you know them. Uh, and uh, she actually was saying that she was here at the very, very first meeting, 40 years ago. She did want to let people know she was only four years old at the time. But, uh, <laughs> not really. But um, So that's a long, long time. We've just, Liz and I, not just me, Liz and I had deep, deep friendships with um, a a lot of people in this church community. And we've been invited by the elders to kind of come in, sit in for a month. Um, You have the joy or suffering of hearing me preach three times here 
over into February. Um, but to be honest with you, the, the, the greatest thing for us beyond the privilege of preaching is actually getting into the homes of people, spending time with people, really, really getting under the surface and getting to know because you don't see that on a Sunday morning. Have you noticed that? Sundays are great, but you're in, you're out. You don't really do life together. And so one of the things, church is so important that it's a community, not of people who attend occasionally on a Sunday, but are actually joined into the family together. So a big part of our next few weeks is just being amongst the family. We had a, a elders uh, leadership, the elders team couples together just in the room up there yesterday. We had a day out together. It was just absolutely wonderful touching base and getting to know what God's doing amongst you um, as a church. So lots and lots of conversations. And I guess really the two things that are on our heart for these next few weeks, uh, if, if, if at all, I mean, it's just, we're just normal people just, but to serve you, that's the first thing as a church community in any way that we can to encourage you in the vision and the calling and the mission that God has given Jubilee Community Church as a local church, whatever way coming alongside to help that. And secondly, to catch up the local church, Jubilee Community Church, in global mission. The calling of God upon us as churches to proclaim the gospel, not only in this town, but beyond. And we, as you've heard already this morning through the interview uh, with Jim, Chris has just been interviewed uh, in the meeting back there at OBS. And uh, basically to introduce more and more of us to this global family called New Frontiers, which we've had the privilege of being part of for so many, many years. And for you not to just know that you're part of that or you're associated with it, but to begin to really experience what's this going to be like as a, a global family. And then this coming Wednesday, we have the privilege to unpack that a little bit more as we are interviewed and uh, take the journey on a little bit further. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd love you to turn to Isaiah chapter 9, a very well-known scripture. And Isaiah chapter 9, you kind of sing the first verse at Christmas events and things, or it's read out. But actually, it's the second verse that I want to really home in on. Isaiah 9, 6, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it, and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this and I've entitled this word God's ever increasing kingdom and it's part of three so you need to come to the second and the third <laughs> because it's going to build up a, a picture mostly about what God's called you as a local church to be a part of that affects the nations of the world. So if you can, come to the others as well. I mean, Isaiah 9, 6 to 7, you can just read it off, but it's absolutely remarkable. It's a prophetic promise and statement about so many, many things. Of the increase of his government and peace, there'll be no end. On the throne of David, and over his kingdom. It's talking about a situation that thrills me because it's reminding me through this promise that God is on the throne, that he is in charge, that he has been established. Jesus rose from the dead, ascended on high, and sat down at the right hand of the Father on high, which signifies all authority. Every name that can be named, he is above. Every government comes and goes and falls. American presidents come and strut, but then they fall away. And yet this Jesus, this kingdom, is established forever. Meaning that whatever happens in the universe, he is the one that holds all things together. The future is sure. The comfort that gives me in an ever-changing world 
with dramatic events going on that we know, we call this our planet, by the way. It's not our planet. We didn't, we didn't create it. But when it's all swirling around and things are happening, just to wake up in the morning and to know that there is one alone who is in charge of all things. It says that it's been established. And not only has it been established and upheld, but also it's an ever-increasing kingdom. So this rule and government and authority has been established, hallelujah, that, that changes everything for all of us. But it's on the earth, and it's growing, and it's increasing. And of its increase, it says, there will be no end. How is that going to happen? Through our te technological advance, through our numbers, through our elders? Is it going to happen through our faith even, to believe that this can happen? We'll look at the end of verse 7. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Wow. Not only does he get to establish the kingdom, and not only does he prophetically promise it'll be an ever-increasing kingdom, but also he's the one that makes sure that it happens. He's more zealous for this than you and me. He, he is absolutely with us and for us and champion us in terms of this kingdom growing and increasing so <clears throat> i go from comfort and i go from wow it's been established and yes believing it's increasing and then realizing the reason it's increasing is not through my efforts and through my trying really hard obviously we all have a part to play but at the end of the day you and i won't be around i mean it's great the jubilee's had 40 years there's a lot of us that won't be here in the next 40 years, and yet his kingdom will be, and the increase will be growing, and generations will come and take things on even further than we have known. It's amazing to have that big picture. I suppose what I'm trying to do is lift your eyes to the big picture of what God has in store for all of us. And you know, when you turn to the New Testament, you find Jesus talking endlessly about the kingdom of God. Over 80 times in the New Testament, he talks about the kingdom of God. He talks about the kingdom of God increasing. It's a big deal for Jesus that the kingdom of God is something established by God. And what we're going to see just this morning is what happens when the seed of the kingdom is sown. So let's see what Jesus has to say about this. Just a, a, a couple of scriptures. There are so many we could look at. But Luke um, is the first one, and Luke chapter 13 and verse 18. What is the kingdom of God like, says Jesus? To what shall I compare it? It's like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden, and it grew and became a tree. And the birds of the air made nests in its branches. Again, he said, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It's like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. Mark chapter 4 and verse 26. Jesus again said, The kingdom of God is as a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprout, sprouts and grows, and he knows not how. Verse 30, Jesus said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable shall we use for it? it is like a grain of mustard seed which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth yet when it is sown it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in the shade we moved into the house that we live in about 20 years ago. And when we lived in, we moved into the house, we had a, a garden. It's not a very big garden, but big enough for my wife to transform it by the planting of seeds and the growing of trees. She didn't ask my permission. She didn't talk to me about it because she knew I was not a gardener or interested. And to be honest with you, typical guy, I'm very happy to leave. So I do cut the lawn. That's what men do. But uh, she, she does the rest. I didn't know she decided to plant trees. These trees began to grow as the years went by. There's one particular tree I discovered. It's called a twisted willow, and it literally does not stop growing 
once you've planted it. So she plants this twisted willow. I mean, 20 years later, it is so enormous. It is massive. I haven't seen my neighbors for at least 10 years. It's just like, <laughs> it, it just encompasses everything. And we've got this weird thing in London. Okay, about 40 years ago, someone let parakeets out of an aviary. And they, kingdom principle, they have increased and multiplied. And literally this passage of scripture has been fulfilled in my garden. <laughs> Even birds now come and nest <coughs> in this tree it is just incredible when we it's an interesting little side thing when you see and hear things in scripture like the parables it's not just they're an old dusty book they're in the reality of our lives and you know there are principles in in the universe that are natural you just can't do anything about it so if you have a room and decide not to touch it and just leave it there and it's got stuff in it I guarantee the principle will be this. As the years go by, dust will come, corrosion will come, smells will come. If you just leave it, what does it do? The natural process is one of decay. If you don't touch something, whether you like it or not, it will slowly and gradually decay. Now, God has principles, universal principles, and what I want you to understand is they will have the same result Every time, just like a de every room decays if you leave it, everything that God plants has a process that will happen wherever it's planted or whatever goes from there. And one commentator commenting actually on these parables of Jesus concerning the kingdom just says this simple phrase, and I love it, the final outcome is inevitable once the natural process has begun let me repeat that the final outcome is inevitable once the natural process has begun i said we have four children we have three daughters one son and uh daniel is now six foot five he wasn't born six foot five which is really great news for us as a couple and he had this we had this city and when he was four, he just loved to lie in it. And when he was 10, he would still lie in it, but he'd have to put his head up one part of the bed and his feet would just start to, and then when he was 13, his head went right over the settee and his legs would dangle over the other side. By the time he was 18, we never saw that settee ever again because he just enveloped the whole thing final outcome is inevitable once the natural process has begun and I love this phrase in new ground we sometimes talk about it I nicked it from a book by a guy called Andy McCulloch who was quoting is a kind of Chinese proverb and it's this all the tree is in the seed all the tree is in the seed it's an amazing statement we're planting churches in in lots of countries and um I just know that the church planters have found this thing. Do you ever know phrases you think, that should be in the Bible, that's so good. It's not in the Bible, all right? But there's truth in it, isn't there? You see, the DNA that you've got doesn't come later in life. It comes from the very first moment you're born. Church's DNA doesn't get discovered later, it's here. And if you're planting a church in Berlin or Brussels, which is really, really tough, just to know that all the ingredients of this little seed in a school, in a back room that no one's ever heard of, then all the potential for this to become an enormous tree is here because God has planted us in this city. God's process has already begun in your life. He's planted a seed in you and through you. He's planted a seed in the local church and it's going to go from here out into the society. And if you're part of a family of churches, as Jim was talking about just now, the same principle is there. That the seed being sown means that the family of churches will inevitably grow through all of its difficulties and tribulations into the nations of the world. And the inevitable process, the inevitable results are these. God initiates it, 
God sustains it, God grows it, and it's of eternal value. Do I hear an amen from any quarters? This feels like home. Um, number one, God initiates. And it's just really important for me as an individual to know that there was a day in my life as a 17-year-old, raised in a Baptist church, rebellious and hating every moment, that God in his grace planted a seed in my heart that caused me to be born again. Undeserved, unmerited, unearned. He just came and planted that seed in me. It says in Ephesians chapter 2 that you were dead in your trespasses and sins. But out of God's great love and mercy, he has made you alive through Christ Jesus. The description of you before you became a Christian, spiritually, is that you were dead. Now, I don't know whether it's true in South Africa, but where I come from, dead people can't do a lot. Once they're dead, they're dead. And there are not shades of deadness. Some kids raised in church think they're not as dead as the drug addict that's never heard about Jesus. you, You are as dead as they are. The testimonies that we sometimes bring in meetings, you know, you hear these, we put people up who've got amazing testimonies, but there are a lot about them. I used to be a drug addict. I used to, you know, have a drink problem. I used to be a womanizer. Go, whoa. And then when I was five, I began to, and we all go, this is amazing. And then I came to Jesus and I've been walking with him ever since. Okay, well, there's truth in some of that, but here's the real description of you, dead. You couldn't do anything about it. To come alive, someone else has got to initiate. It's not going to happen without that. And if you turn and you believe and you repent and you open your life, it's not what you do, it's what he does. So our testimonies are not really about us. I get, you know, we've got interesting and people need to know what Jesus can do for hopeless cases. But at the end of the day, it really is all about him, amen? It's just for him and for his wonderful glory. And why is that important? Well, it fills you with confidence. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Well, I didn't begin it, so my confidence is the one who began it. He is the author, and he is the finisher of our faith. Not only does God plant seeds in our lives as individuals that the process then begins, but he also does it in local churches. Forty years ago, a group of people, by faith, believed God that this thing should be what it is today. This is not the end of the story, 40 years later. It's still just really the beginning. But they pioneered and a seed was planted all those years ago. And Jubilee Church came into existence. And it was initiated by God. And he's the one who gets all the glory. The New Frontiers Church that we're a part of, uh, the the, the whole New Frontiers family of churches that we're a part of, I mean, Liz and I were there kind of like over 40 years ago when it was kind of kicking off. Just five churches in southeast England, Jim's church that he pastors was actually one of the five, and we were like one of the five. It's been an extraordinary journey since those early days to see this thing grow and expand and go to the nations and now be a global family together. And if you meet New Frontiers guys who have been around for a lot, they've got a really strange look on their face. The strange look is, how on earth did this ever happen? Well, it happened not because we had a bright idea. It happened because God in his grace planted a seed. And the principle is this, that he is the one who initiates this. The second principle that always happens when God plants a seed of his kingdom, his ever-increasing kingdom, is this. He sustains it. He nurtures and protects and waters and cares for it. He does that for his church. He does that for you as an individual as well. And sure, you have a part to play. 
You know, if you're an isolated Christian, that's not good news. You need to be part of a church community. So you are the one that steps into that decision. No one can make you do it. It's not imposed. It's your joy and your free will. But it's wise because you'll never become a disciple if you just live as an individual. So you make that step. It's important that you understand the word of God. It's important that as Jim's testimony just now is that you open yourself for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. God doesn't impose these things. He responds to our faith. It's important. I could go on and on to talk about the part that we play. But in no way are you left to sustain this. If you think, I have got to really try hard now that the seed has come to make it grow. Yes, play your part where you can, but understand this. It's God who will sustain you. And it, it, it's, it's so important that you understand Jesus said things like this. None shall pluck you out of my hands. Paul says, I have learned that nothing can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus said, I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you once that seed has been planted in you. You don't get to carry God. He gets to carry you. You are not clinging on to this salvation by your fingertips. The everlasting arms of God are around you. It's fantastic just to know and the security that comes that he is faithful to his promises to the end. You know, you're going to go on a journey. Jesus was there at the beginning and he's the only one guaranteed to be there at the end. Your best friends might not be there at the end, but Jesus will be and he's the one who sustains you. And of course, it's true of the local church as a principle. Local church gets established It needs to be sustained. There are schemes of the enemy to try and destroy the church. There's opposition that comes from man. Right now where I live in a European context, we are increasingly facing a society that is angry about people like us even existing. When that sort of thing starts to happen, you think, well, are we going to survive this? Is it going to... What's going to happen to us? But to know that the one who initiated is the one who sustains is just absolutely wonderful. And there's just something in the world that they just haven't twigged. And that is this. If you oppose this seed, it only grows all the more. Isn't that hilarious? Someone needs to tell them. And the more, you know, Jesus said if a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, then it produces much fruit. If a little seed just is on the top of the soil, not a lot's going to happen. So let's put it in the soil. Let's trample it down. Let's persecute it. Let's try and bring it to an end. Little do you know, you've just helped it to grow all the more. Acts 8, 1. <clears throat> there was a huge persecution that comes to this seed. And the next verse says, and so the Christians were scattered. What did they scatter? (laughs) They scattered the seed. One seed became multiple seeds. You can't stop the ever-increasing kingdom that God has established. Bring it on. It's only going to make it grow. We have the joy of knowing, you mentioned India. It's actually 500 churches in India now, part of New Frontiers. In India and in China, we have wonderful people to contact with. They are now going through the worst persecution that anybody can remember. And it's difficult and tough and really, it's all underground. They even have, in China, banned online church. Try that for a size. So if you're found watching it, you'll have a knock on the door. It's serious stuff. But the church in India and in China has never known growth like it. Through it all, Everything is growing and expanding and multiplying because Jesus is the one who's sustaining that which he has planted. Jubilee Church, 40 years, that's a long time. Ups and downs, good seasons, bad seasons, difficulties. People come, people go. And on top of that, we hit a thing called global pandemic covid and we have to go through all of this without, you know, everything happening and we can't meet, et cetera, et cetera. 
and all the difficulties that everybody, including the global church, has had to face as a result of that. And then you've, as a church, there's been recent difficulties at leadership level, etc. Here's the miracle. We're still here. <laughs> How come we're still here where well, our technology was amazing during COVID? How come we're still here where the elders are just, you know, super duper gifted people? How come we're still here? Well, because we had the, the numbers to, all of those things are not true. The only reason through every up and down and everything that a local church goes through, the only thing is God. If something's of man, it will inevitably die. But if it's of God, it will be sustained till the end. Principle number three. It starts small and it grows. And that's just the principle. I mentioned the decaying room. Here's another one. If God has established a seed, it will inevitably grow. The mustard seed is the smallest. You can't even see a mustard seed in your, the palm of your hand. That's how small it is. But it's going to grow. Why? Because there's an inevitable outcome of the thing that God has established. Even God speaks to Adam and Eve and says, I want you to be fruitful and multiply. And in that process, there's this catastrophic, disastrous desire for equality with God, which means sin is impregnated into the entire human race. But despite that, the fruitful and multiplication had already been established. We're in sin, but the multiplication is. And as I travel around the world, and as I look about the nations of the world, and I visit the nations of the world, I think Adam and Eve did a pretty good job, to be honest. They were fruitful, and they multiplied. Listen, and I, last November, were in Sao Paulo uh, in Brazil. 25 million people live in Sao Paulo. Traffic is really interesting in that city. I think Adam and Eve did a pretty good job. Look, Sao Paulo, 25 minutes. We're filling the earth, humanity, because that's the principle that was established. God says to Abraham, you will be the father of many nations. You will multi count the stars, can you? Look at the grains of, 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 on the sand. Can you count them? Well, of course you can't. Well, that's what I promise you're going to have as an offspring. But it started with Isaac one son one son begins the journey because that's the principle it begins small and then it grows we don't often think of jesus as a seed but there came that moment that perfect timing when jesus is planted as a seed and look what's happened since it says in romans chapter 8 verse 29 for those who he foreknew he also predestined to being conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn, the firstborn among his brothers, the firstborn of a new humanity, which would cover every tribe and every tongue and every nation, multiplied disciples of Jesus. To this day, there are more Christians on the planet than have ever existed before, and it's growing and increasing at a, such a remarkable rate. But it began by Jesus being the firstborn. And it says in the Bible that around the throne of heaven, we won't be able to number all those who believed and became followers of Jesus. The seed is sown on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit is poured out on that first day. And so the first outreach, if you like, with 3,000 added on that particular day, begins a journey. The book of Acts covers about 30 years. By the end of the book of Acts, this seed on the day of Pentecost, which was promised to go to you, your children's children, and to those who are far off, has really impacted the entire Roman Empire just in a period of about 30 years. And of course, that's not the end because ever since the end of the book of Acts, this growing, growing kingdom has been expanding throughout the entire earth. It's just a remarkable story of this principle. Your own individual story is true as well, isn't it? One day God planted that seed in you, but it was the beginning and not the end. It's growing. I just knew I was saved on the day that I got saved. But roll on a few years later, I've had the joy, as you can have the joy, 
of just seeing this seed grow and through ups and downs and tribulations and difficulties and weakness and understanding more of the height and the depth and the width and the breadth of the love of God, the invitation is, don't stop when you become a Christian, but know this, there's an ocean for you to enter into and discover of the things of God. And then, of course, the local church. Every local church has the same DNA. If your local church has been established by Jesus, and unless the Lord builds the house, we labor in vain, so let's make sure he's the one who's begun this congregation. And having established, yeah, this is God. He's, he's the one who's planted this. This congregation is in his hand and in his purpose. Then the inevitability that though it starts small, it's going to grow. Acts 1.8, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. See, it's just the same principle everywhere. Calling of you here in Clusty is to do your Jerusalem, your surrounding area, and Judea beyond. And your Samaria, and even people from this church will go to the ends of the earth to proclaim the gospel. It's not down to us or our technology, technology or our numbers. It really is going to be God who caused this thing to grow. I love this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Lex, Dave, Jim, servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants or he who waters is anything. It's not very comforting, is it? Actually, it is. But God, only God, who gives the growth. To be in a community, to know it's not down to people who are actually here today and gone tomorrow. But our confidence is that it's down to the one who initiated it. You're going, you're going to grow. It's inevitable once the process has begun. I spoke to a lady at the end of one of our meetings back in London quite a few years ago now. We were going through a huge growth spurt. She said, David, I just like it small. I don't like that it grows. I like my church to be small. Uh, and I didn't apologize. I said, well, you know, that's going to be difficult for you then. Because churches that God has planted have the habit of growing. Expressions of the kingdom that man has planted, they're the ones that are small. So I said, uh, I tried to help her. I said, do we have small groups in our church? Are you in a small group? She said, no, no, I don't like small groups. <laughs> so I'm like, why don't you have small groups? Well, it all gets too friendly and people get to know you. And blah, blah, blah. I said, we have a problem here. She said, well, the problem is solved because I'm going to leave. I was really sad. I said, I said I'm so sorry. Um, she said, I, I, just, I can't be in a, a large church. I need to go to a small church. So she left us and joined another church that I know quite well, actually, was absolutely smaller. Guess what happened? <laughs> it started to grow and grow and grow and grow. And I was still kind of in contact with a person who was a friend of her, and she then left that church because it was growing to find another church as to my knowledge, I've lost contact now, she might still be trying to find a, a, a church that Jesus is planting that's not. What she's trying to express is when you're part of a big thing, you're robbed of relationships or friendship. Listen, the answer is not to stop growing. It's to find wineskin that accommodates relationship and community within the context. You know, people often quote Acts chapter 2, 42 to 47, you know, these people were in homes and they were having community. Oh, I want something like that. Yeah, but there were 3,000 of them before they started. It wasn't an anti-growth thing. It was just all together in the same place. Jubilee Community Church, a seed that grows, a prophetic promise that goes beyond our walls and goes to the nations of the world. It's in your DNA. Can I just say this? Jubilee Community Church is blessing the world. It's going beyond your walls, whether you're even aware of it or not. So Chris Taylor, who was just interviewed in the meeting before, was the youth pastor here. He's now in Holland. He's planted eight churches in different nations. And out of a little seed in, in him, when he got 
to this church. He'd never been in a church like this before. And now he's seeing nations being transformed. I've got a guy on who's part of our core team called Brett Melville. He's, a, he's born again in Jubilee Community Church. And he's now affecting us as we go forward. I have a friend called Evan Rogers. Some of you might remember him. It's a bit of a, yeah, never had any shoes on his feet, even in winter. Uh, worship leader, at, gone to, he's now in New Hampshire doing the most amazing thing. I could just find people all over the place. The seed keeps on growing and expanding. And maybe Jubilee Community Church is called to plant other churches in this city and plant other churches beyond it. And some of us will be part of that because it's God's ever-increasing kingdom. The walls of our buildings must simply not limit us and our faith level to move forward. And very quickly, even the New Frontiers story, and if you come on Wednesday night, you'll hear more of this unpacked. A guy called Terry Virgo in the early 60s, hungry for God, gets baptized in the Holy Spirit, finds he has the ability to witness to people that he didn't have before, gave up his job in London, and literally went around knocking doors without any financial backing on an estate, a tough estate in Brighton, in South England. And he begins to pray, and a few people join him. And he has a heart for revival, which still pumps in his heart to this day. And during the process, he begins to discover through the Bible a vision of the local church. So he, he takes on a church, and he grows it, and, and together they learn. What does it mean to be a charismatic, evangelical community that's really enjoying the Spirit, but always based on the Word of God, with the sense of mission and grace and all these wonderful principles? And then few people join him. Liz and I joined him. Jim's church joined him. And then we grew a little bit. And then, and then we grew some more. And, and, and we went throughout the nation. Other nations kept knocking on the door. It just starts with one guy having a seed that doesn't know where this might go. And then over the years, with expansion and with growth and with connections, it's just been an amazing journey. You know, 13 years ago, we made the decision that we should multiply so that one family becomes multiple families, part of the global family. One team becomes multiple teams, which is how things like New Ground got birthed. And I had friends that said, this is never going to work. It will never, ever work. It can't hold together. Well, the fruit of it, because it was born of God, is the expansion has been remarkable. Over 2,000 churches in 90 nations, and a sense of family and love and unity has never been as strong as it is right now and so his story becomes our story one seed multiplies and God does amazing amazing things throughout the world he was you know younger guy there he's in his 80s now and he's still going and you have the joy and privilege on Sunday the 12th of February at Obs to hear him I would advise you to go and listen to the ever increasing story that God is doing amongst us Finally, final point, final principle is this, it's eternal. So God initiates, God sustains, and then God comes along and grows it, and then just reminds us that this is not an earthbound thing. This goes on into eternity. Do you know there are only two things that will go on into eternity? One is you, and when I say you, I mean the seed that God planted in you. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Since you've been born again, not of a perishable seed, but of an imperishable seed. If you're a Christian today and God planted that seed in you, whenever that was, something of eternity was planted into you. And when you die, that which God put in you goes on into eternity and the Bible says there is a new body. The reason we die is because the outer man is wasting away because something inside of you can't stay in this temporal body. It needs to have its full expression into eternity. And the second thing is the bride of Christ. She is the only thing on this planet that's going to go into eternity. I've read the back of the book, by the way, and she makes it. Despite everything, 
The bride of Christ is there at the marriage of the Lamb. And just throw this one out. What a wise investment it would be to pour your energies, your finances, your time into something of eternal value rather than something that is temporary. Now, we have to live in the temporary world. We have to do things and spend money, etc. But how wonderful it would be if we lifted our heads and thought, I would love to, that's a good investment. Something of value that's going to go into eternity. Let's pray together. I want to pray, Lord, for anybody here today who has maybe had their confidence knocked over the years, maybe disappointments, maybe frustrated with things, disillusioned, had a vision, but it just doesn't seem, when will we, when, when will we see this thing? I pray for any today like that, that this simple word will be a huge encouragement. That the principle is still the same it's in your word, that you will bring it to pass. We are part of an ever-increasing kingdom. I pray for any today who have felt robbed of a global expression. You may feel parochial. You may feel hemmed in. Just pray not only today, but maybe in the coming weeks, you, your eyes will be lifted. You will remember that you are part of a wonderful global family that's growing and expanding. You're not alone. You have brothers and sisters of every tribe, every tongue, and every nation standing hand in hand with you and shoulder to shoulder and praying for Cape Town that the kingdom of God will come and ever, ever increase. Please come to us now, Lord. Even let the seed of your word be planted in our hearts that in weeks to come, it will still be bearing fruit and growing. We ask this for your wonderful glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Next week, I would like to take you on a bit more of a journey to look at how particularly apostolic ministry helps to play a part in making sure all the things we've said this morning um, actually becomes a reality. And if you want to hear more of the story, then do come and join us on Wednesday as well. Amen. Thank you so much, Dave. Very, very helpful. And the first of three parts, so that's really helpful to... Let me just make a couple of kind of concluding uh, comments. We have always, since the early 80s as a local church, um, considered ourselves a New Frontiers church. We've always kind of talked about ourselves as a New Frontiers church. But there is a sense in which we are now re-engaging with that broader family um, after kind of some distance, really. Um, what that re-engagement doesn't mean is it doesn't mean it's all going to get more English, even though it sounded very English today. Um, what it actually means is that we are connecting into something that is bigger than us. And it should result in us being released to reach and plant into more and more non-English speaking contexts. That's actually what's been happening globally across the New Frontiers family. But it, what it means for us is we, we will be reaching into and planting into cities and into nations in Southern Africa and, and kind of reigniting our kind of placing in Africa uh, so I think this is, the, this is a seed kind of moment again for us as a church. And so even though we're looking at the seed and it, it's, it's in seed form once again, uh, actually it's going to enable us to expand in a, in a very wonderful way. And again, it's not a call to brand loyalty. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. This is... 
the government of Jesus, the kingdom of God increasing and expanding. So I want to encourage us over this next month, as we're hearing from Dave and from Liz, we'll hear more from Liz on Wednesday evening. That's this coming Wednesday, 7.30, at our observatory site. Um, we, we want to continue to learn and engage with what being part of a global family really means. Um, and we're not going to just necessarily come out with badges of, you know, whatever that thing is. But it's actually we're re-engaging with something that God's doing. And that's going to be really good for us. We've still got power, which is wonderful. And that means our baristas are ready to serve you with some fantastic coffee. Don't miss that. This is a social context in which you can say hello to a complete stranger, and so long as they don't look like nutcases, you're good to go on a conversation, and we're allowed to make new friends. So bless you. Thanks for being here tonight, uh, today, and we hope to see you on Wednesday night as well. God bless.